It gives me great pleasure actually to, um, to introduce Grace to you this evening. So um, I first met Grace uh, over five years ago now when I started teaching social entrepreneurship in the business faculty here and I was advised make sure you go and um, get in touch with, with Grace and, 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 uh, and she'll look after you. I think they were James Murphy's words actually and, um, and in that, that first year she actually did two guest lectures for me and uh, which is you know, certainly more than, more than the average and, uh, and ever since she's uh, delivered guest lectures and um, been on panels of, of Shark Tank panels and, and that sort of thing so she's been enormously supportive and has continued to support, uh, support Compass and is, is a member of our social council as well. Our students have, have certainly really appreciated her insights and, and her general knowledge, but especially appreciate, um, you will hear that, that Grace does come from a more critical perspective than most. She tells it like it is. And um, yeah, she will make you very aware that uh, uh, starting a social enterprise can can be hard work. There can be a lot of obstacles to, to overcome, but but obviously there is uh, uh, you know great social benefit and rewards uh, that go along with that. You might may not be uh, very well aware that that Grace actually has another day job, and I, I believe I should mention that to you. So, Grace is an art historian, curator, writer, and arts enterprise advisor. She did her PhD in art history here at this university, finishing in 2008, and she's now a vice chancellor's research fellow at RMIT. But then in 2009, she, uh, she launched uh, the Social Studio, which brought together that love for, for art and creativity and design that she has together with her passion for social justice and community engagement. So as she will tell you, the Social Studio is a, a complex social enterprise. It um, combines fa a fashion school, fashion retail outlet and cafe in Smith Street, Collingwood. It's a creative social enterprise working with fashion and design to create employment and educational opportunities for young people from humanitarian migrant backgrounds. And often those backgrounds are very difficult and traumatic backgrounds such as Somalia and, and Sri Lanka. And, and what uh, the social studio have really created is a, a safe space where they can find their feet in a strange new culture, develop a career path and express their inner creativity. Grace also in 2011 won a Churchill Fellowship to study creative social enterprises uh, across the world in, in the US, UK, Cambodia, Uganda and Ghana and she is currently an advisor to the Social Outfit in Sydney, Twitch Women's Sewing Collective in Dandenong. She's a board member for the Art Association of Australia and New Zealand and a co-founder of the Welcome Committee Incorporated. Grace is especially articulate, knowledgeable and has very strong social justice values. She, you, you will understand that she really does care about people in the world and I believe, she'll hate me for saying this, um, but that she is really a great role model and inspiration for you on how to use social enterprise to create positive difference in the world. So please, welcome Grace. Um, so <clears throat> I have a few different parts to the talk that I'm going to give for you this evening. Um, the first is just a very brief kind of background on social enterprise, what I'm going to call the light and the dark, um, hinting at, as Ben suggested, a slightly more critical but not necessarily negative um, perspective on social entrepreneurship. Um, from there, I'm going to talk to you about The Social Studio, um, an organisation that I helped to start in 2009 um, and I'm still a board member of. Um, and I'll also give you from there some insight into thoughts that I have about different models of scale and replication in social enterprise. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about some of the challenges and um, complexities of trying to really hold close the social mission in social entrepreneurship. Um, after that, uh, it would be great to have more of an open discussion and conversation with you. Um, so, as I'm sure you all know, uh, it's estimated that in Australia, there are more than 20,000 social enterprises operating and contributing 2-3% to of national GDP. 
The sector has seen significant investment from both public and private sources. And there is growing interest in large-scale policy development to further support the sector. Social enterprise also has the potential to support sustainable economic development by privileging cultural and social goals alongside the quest for economic growth. It's sort of the holy grail, can we have it all? However, social enterprise also has a dark side including the demise of values around social welfare in favour of profit-driven motives in the social sector. The outsourcing of what was once considered to be government services and the perpetuation of inequalities between those that manage and those that benefit from these enterprises. Conforming to a logic of economic growth over social, community and cultural values. Um, as researcher and commentator um, Marie-Lisa Decaney observes in her study of social enterprises that work in communities experiencing poverty, and I'm quoting, social enterprises that engage the poor as passive beneficiaries have a tendency to foster subservience and dependency that may lead to a hardening of social exclusion. In this light, it is perhaps not surprising that social enterprise literature has emerged predominantly from the field of business management. As a result, there's a strong body of work that examines the structures and processes of managing social enterprises. Despite this body of literature, a significant gap has been identified in addressing the cultural, the social, and the non-economic dimensions of social enterprise, resulting in an over-representation of perspectives that privilege the economic and technocratic aspects of social entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm particularly interested in this in the context of the arts, which is the area that I work in. Um, art has a long history of challenging, transforming, and exceeding conventional understandings of value, both economic and social. So in my talk today, I hope to address this gap somewhat by exploring the potential role of creative social enterprises in contributing to sustainable community development at the same time as activating positions of critique and political engagement. And I'm going to do this mainly in relation to the example of the social studio. However, I'm drawing upon a range of research into social enterprises, both in Australia and overseas. Um, the inclusion of differing and marginal voices is crucial in the context of social enterprise, which often has the aim of serving marginalised com communities or transforming disadvantage. However, many social enterprises are formed without a deep engagement with local context and managed by people with high levels of what you might call social capital. John Huggett, an advisor in the field of social enterprise in the UK, warns against what he calls the tendency to celebrate the heroic individual in philanthropy and social enterprise which often inflates the perceived importance of highly educated, articulate and networked individuals. As he argues, this focus on the meritorious individual is often at the expense of valuing the collaborative work and efforts of the communities who are supposed to benefit. He calls this a meritocracy and he says, I'm quoting, meritocrats in government and philanthropy give support contracts and capital to those they trust. Trustees are usually well-spoken and well-heeled. Award ceremonies can show a hierarchy with the great and the good at the top, the entrepreneur in the middle and the beneficiaries at the bottom. Instead, he suggests that social enterprise should embrace more of a ground up approach providing tools and opportunities to those who experience social problems, rather than those who seek to help. 
And this is a question of power that lies at the heart of not only social enterprise, but also at the heart of the notion of welfare itself, delivered across a range of social and organisational platforms. Are those who are supposed to benefit from social enterprise active in setting the direction of the organisation, therefore transforming their relative social position? Or do they become passive recipients of support, maintaining the status quo? A further problem related to the cult of meritocracy is the assumption that for a social enterprise to be considered successful, it must generate enough financial return to grow. In fact, when you look at research data internationally, what's revealed is that the majority of social enterprises are actually not profit making. And many of them have organisational models that reflect this reality. These findings reflect the lived experience of many social enterprises that I have worked with and which provide incredible social and community outcomes. So this is not to say that social enterprises should not try to make money and become sustainable. But without a core focus on social impact, they are just businesses and in fact you can do more harm than good. So that's a bit of a background that <laughs> I'm going to uh, set you off with um, and it might help to understand some of the perspectives and approaches that we've taken with the social studio. Um, okay, so this is just the website for the social studio to give you um, a little bit of background. So the story of the social studio started in 2009, a year and a half after I finished my PhD. Alongside my studies, I'd been working in social enterprise and community development for a number of years. I'd been working in migrant settlement um, and had been uh, unbelievably struck by the high levels of unemployment that a lot of new migrants were facing, um, and especially those from humanitarian migrant or refugee backgrounds. Now this rate varies from at the lower end, it's quoted to be between 15 and 20% rates of unemployment. Um, at the higher end, in particular areas of greater disadvantage, it's as high as between 40 and 50% unemployment. There was an urgent need for employment opportunities and work. And at the same time, very high levels of um, high school dropout for young people who'd arrived as teenagers in Australia. The reason for that, um, uh, well, the reasons are many and complex, um, but in particular, young people arriving in Australia as migrants are often placed in age-relative classrooms. Um, and having spent many years um, between leaving their home country, living in particularly in humanitarian camps, having missed out on numbers of years of education and most often finding English as a second language, um, suddenly being in, say, a 15-year-old being placed into a year 10 classroom without additional support meant that a lot of pe young people were set up for failure. There was definitely a need for alternative educational models. Uh, a number of initiatives that I'd been involved with were working um, in some senses, but the opportunity for people involved to transition from these sorts of programs, often short term, into the workforce or mainstream education um, were failing, were lacking. The social studio emerged as a sort of madcap idea that lots of people believed in and helped to make happen. So uh, there was no other example like this in existence. It was a completely new idea and new model. Um, the social studio is a social enterprise in Collingwood, in Melbourne, um, born out of the creativity and talent of young people who've experienced being a refugee prior to migrating to Australia. I'm quite careful in the use of the word refugee um, because I'm aware that for a lot of people it's an experience that they go through and it's not a label. It doesn't define who they are. Unfortunately, the term is often used as a label and that can be um, quite counterproductive. Um, the social studio is a fashion label. 
um, you can get a sense of some of the designs on the website here. It's also a clothing shop selling um, the fashion label and also other emerging designers. It's a cafe. It's a digital fabric printing studio. It's a school that delivers TAFE programs in fashion in partnership with RMIT School of Fashion. It's a community drop-in centre and it's also a second home for many of the people who work there. So it's a complex hybrid model. It's not particularly um, streamlined or simple or easy to replicate. I've been involved in the social studio journey from the initial idea through to today. And I've done everything from washing dishes and making coffees uh, to stamping envelopes and painting walls. It's a multicultural, multi-religious space where relationships of power and class are constantly negotiated and shifting. It started as a sketch, an idea, a plan, and evolved into something that resembles the initial idea, but it is also completely different to that initial idea. And it's been radically informed by the contributions of students, staff, designers, board members, and the local community in which it operates. I'm going to outline five sort of key ideas that underpin the development of the studio. So the, the first idea is the relationship between design and power. So design is one of the most influential and important languages of contemporary life. Designers have the power to shape our landscape, the spaces in which we live, walk, communicate, the things that surround us, our entire visual and physical landscape is designed. But who are our designers? How do they get to have so much power over us? Who do they design for? And who gets left out of this process? So at the social studio, we have a very non-hierarchical approach to design. It's collaborative, it's iterative. Um, we work with fabrics that are donated to us. We make do with what we have. There's no master designer who kind of dictates the look and feel of what happens. This is much harder to manage in a creative sense, but it does change the relationship of power and design to each other. Uh, the second key idea is that of celebrating difference. So the social studio community offers and embraces opportunities to think differently. To think differently about values like time and our obsession with speed and punctuality and efficiency in Australian life, which doesn't always make us happy. To think differently about values of achievement and success. Um, the experience of war is something that changes perspectives on what achievement might be in a conventional sense. To embrace risk and to be bold, because life is short and risky. Uh, the third idea that underpins what we do is a relationship between an end product and the process that um, leads to its creation. So in general, in our kind of modern consumerist world, we've forgotten what it takes to actually make things by hand. We always encounter a polished end product, usually in a beautifully set up boutique, without any sense of what was involved in creating that end product. As a result, we've lost an understanding of the time, the material and the skill involved in creating things. We switch our minds and eyes off to the reality of sweatshop labour and industrial production. The true cost of producing something is often very different to the number that shows up on a swing tag. So what happens instead when we're forced to think about process, the time, the human hand involved in making things? So at the social studio, our manufacturing area is integrated with our retail space, which means that when customers walk into the shop, not only do they see the actual clothing on display, but they see the makers making that clothing, and they're often invited to be part of the process. So um, people will select particular fabrics, will talk about designs, um, and that extends to our digital printing area as well. 
The cost is a bit higher because we're employing people at over award rates of pay in Australia. But when people are in that environment and in that context and meeting the maker, it changes their relationship to the actual product. And people are more likely to spend more money on something that will last a long time, that's made with quality and with care. Um, so the fourth idea is the idea of converting trash into treasure. So consumer culture encourages us to seek out new things, shiny things, and as many as we can possibly have. The result, as I'm sure all of you know, <laughs> is an extraordinary overproduction of goods often at a lower quality, that have a shorter life cycle and a greater amount of landfill and trash. In the fashion industry, this involves the waste of millions of tonnes of fabric every year. What happens instead if we treasure our things, if we make things of higher quality that last for a longer time, if we repair and revalue old things and make them new again? The final um, idea that underpins the work of the studio is that of community. So we often take the idea of community a bit for granted. We don't necessarily realise that our networks of friends and family structure many of the opportunities that we have. It's said that between 60 and 70% of jobs are not advertised. Instead, we find out about them through word of mouth, through friends of friends or family through simply knowing someone. What happens if life circumstances separate you from your community and you find yourself not knowing people? <coughs> Suddenly a lot of opportunities disappear. Money is a somewhat finite resource, but the resource of people is potentially infinite. So these five factors or key ideas help to tell the story of what the social studio is and why we exist. But to bring it to life, because um, as I've sort of hinted at, it's very much a community effort and it's a very vibrant and dynamic place. And I can't really do justice to it as a single person standing up here talking. I'd like to show you a video from one of our fashion parades. of some more um, I guess practical discussion about how have we sort of attempted to prioritize our social goals in our journey so we're seven years old now um, I thought I might just talk to you a little bit about the idea of um, expansion and how we've responded to that so there's a lot of interest in the social enterprise sector in the idea of scale of projects that are scalable, um, of growth, and of trying to achieve impact on the biggest scale imaginable. 
Now, as I hinted at earlier, the social studio is a model that's quite complex and it's complex by design. It's complex on purpose because it's addressing a whole range of quite complex and local social and cultural issues. We um, have grown in our own small way, um, but even that has caused a number of interesting tensions and challenges. So, when we first moved into our shop front on Smith Street in Collingwood, it was a tiny single fronted shop front, about I think 70 square metres. We had the retail shop in the front, a manufacturing area, which was also our training area in the middle, and then all the way out the back and down a set of stairs, we had our little cafe. So customers would walk through the retail shop, um, past the manufacturing area and down a set of stairs to get their coffee. Now it was great because the rent was really cheap and when we first started, um, we opened up without enough money to cover rent for a full year. So we needed to be able to do things minimally and uh, in a sort of resource-minded resource way. Um, but we quickly outgrew our size. So we... Um, one of our board members climbed up onto the roof of our shop front one night and peered through the window and discovered that there was an entire second floor to our building that was vacant. The staircase had been taken out and it had just been left dormant for probably about 10 years. So we contacted the landlord and said, what about we strike a deal? Um, we're happy to pay more rent if you can put the staircase back in and make that second story livable. So he agreed to do that um, and that meant that we were able to um, move the training part of the organisation into a dedicated space, um, which was important for us because we'd found that um, combining training with the business side of things caused a lot of um, problems and complexities for our students and we wanted them to have a space that was not at all about the business and was entirely about their learning, um, their making and their experience. So surely this kind of growth, very small growth, moving from downstairs to upstairs, would be seamless, right? No. <laughs> so just this amount of growth caused a lot of anxiety internally within our team. Suddenly everyone felt like we were expanding, we were growing, we were therefore becoming more business-like, um, it would change the nature of their experience with the organisation, um, they felt that we were going to become really corporate <laughs> um, and that we'd lost our sense of values. Now we managed to navigate through that and it didn't take long before things were back on track. But that's an example of how quite a small change can have a big impact particularly on an organisation which is really trying to engender a sense of ownership, community and trust with all of the people involved. If we had have taken a more sort of franchise approach and started opening up social studios in every suburb or shop corner, we quickly would have lost the actual community that we were there to serve. <coughs> and so what we did instead um, was we've worked with a couple of other communities who've wanted to start up a similar type of organisation. And instead of us coming in from an outside sort of top-down perspective and saying, yes, we've got the skills, we're going to help you, we've talked to them about um, the particular issues that they face in their local community. We've encouraged them to set up their own organisations independently with boards that reflect leaders from their local communities and stakeholders, um, particularly those that are supposed to benefit from the particular activities of the organisation. Um, and we've shared all of our knowledge and experience to help them in their startup journey. So this here is um, one of those projects, it's called The Social Outfit, um, and it's based in uh, Newtown in Sydney. Um, an interesting kind of side note is that when the social outfit was starting up, everyone that they met with asked them why they hadn't located their shop in Western Sydney. Um, are people familiar with the sort of demographics and politics of Sydney? So a lot of the particularly new migrant communities are settled in quite far out areas of Western Sydney. 
And no one, ha it hadn't occurred to anyone that it's actually a good idea to bring those communities into the heart of the city and make them a part of the industry, the business and the mainstream community. And instead there's this ongoing thinking that you know, segregates, marginalises and almost ghettoises new migrant communities. Another example is the Twitch Women's Sewing Collective in Dandenong. Um, their website is their Facebook page. <laughs> That's why I've got the Facebook page up. Um, so this was started by a woman called Abuk Bol. Abuk was um, a graduate of the Social Studios retail training program and then fashion program. And then she became an employee in our manufacturing team and basically learnt the entire social studio business from the inside out and then took that knowledge to start up her own social enterprise, um, which is, was in Dandenong and is now in Noble Park and is run entirely by women from the South Sudanese community. Um, for us, that is a truly sustainable and impactful way for our model to sort of scale or grow and replicate without a sort of you know, necessarily being able to show in financial figures scale in a conventional sense. Final project that I'm just going to briefly talk about is another sort of spin-off from the social studio work. And it's another way that I think sort of grassroots community development and social enterprise can seed really interesting new projects without, again, having a more conventional approach to scale and replication. So a couple of years ago, an advertising company came to the social studio and said, we'd like to offer our services to help you do something. What would you like us to do? And at the time, we'd been struggling with a problem, which was that we had a lot of asylum seekers wanting to enrol in our various training programs. And because of visa restrictions, <laughs> they weren't allowed to study. So they were allowed to be in Australia, um, but they weren't allowed to study and they also weren't allowed to work. Um, so <laughs> we'd <laughs> it was quite you know, frustrating to us because we had all these programs and opportunities available and we couldn't actually allow people formally to be involved. We still could have them come in and participate in work experience type programs, but it wasn't the same thing. So we said to this advertising company, you know, it's really hard for us to deliver on our social mission when government policy is the way it is <laughs> and is so restrictive and undermines all of the good work that we're trying to do. So the best way that you could help us is to actually try to develop some advertising campaigns that would help raise public awareness about the human rights of asylum seekers and their experience. Um, so after some time, um, the guys involved in the advertising agency partnered up with us and another group and launched a new social enterprise um, called the Welcome Committee, which sells welcome mats as a gesture of hospitality for asylum seekers in Australia and then uses the money from the sale of those welcome mats um, to run advertising campaigns. The first one is planned for a billboard outside of Sydney Airport and right now is awaiting approval from the advertising uh, company that we're trying to buy the billboard from. So wish us luck in that particular mission. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to briefly wind up the me talking at you part of this presentation to then enable you to start asking me questions. And I'm hoping that I've given enough provocations or leads to you to be able to make it quite an interesting conversation. So in conclusion, um, while social enterprise broadly treads a fine line between privileging economic development for communities and collapsing back into the logic of commercial business, there is an opportunity for models that run counter to conventional wisdom about the function of social enterprise in a capitalist world. 
They may be more precarious in this sense, absolutely, and yet they can be vibrantly transformative in their engagement with both the creative and cultural economy. Thank you. <laughs>